Blessed All Souls Day, everybody. Welcome to the Solemn Pontifical Requiem Mass here at the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Welcome to our viewers who are live and watching this, this Holy Mass live on the Shrine's website, and welcome to all of you who are tuning in on EWTN. God bless you. My name is Father Ambrose. I'm a Norbertine Canon regular from St. Michael's Abbey, and I'm going to be walking us through this beautiful and poignant sacred liturgy today. So we just missed His Eminence uh, Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke walk in uh, in a solemn way here. We, we have a, a little bit of a different Holy Mass today because of the solemnity and also the, the poignant reflective quality of the Requiem Mass here on All Souls Day. So while it still contains all of the marvelous splendor of the ancient Roman rite of Holy Church, Everything is a little bit trimmed down for the Holy Mass today. So I'll help point out some of those things that are different about this Holy Mass and also leave time for, for our prayer while we especially remember the souls of the faithful departed. And of course, Holy Mass today, all of the Masses celebrated all throughout the church today are in suffrage for the Holy Souls and all of those friends and loved ones, family members, benefactors who are still waiting their purification, waiting to, to look upon the face of Christ in glory, and very much desirous of our prayers for them. So welcome to this beautiful opportunity to assist at Holy Mass here with Cardinal Burke. We see a shot there of the catafalque, which is laid out in front of the altar, in fact, outside of the altar rail here at the shrine. There's nobody in that coffin. A catafalque is a, a, a scaffolding which, which holds up a coffin, and that is an empty coffin for a place where uh, the cardinal later, after the Mass is over, will perform what we call the ablutions, special prayers for the dead. So his eminence is just coming in now to the sanctuary. He'll pause and pray for a while, and then we will watch him vest for Holy Mass. As you see, there's no music accompanying the procession here today. Again, as a sign of the solemnity of the day and also the rather penitential quality of a Requiem liturgy. You might also notice that his eminence is not vested in the cardinalatial red today, which is an unusual thing. We, it's rare to see a Cardinal of Holy Church not wearing the cardinalatial red. Rather, His Eminence is wearing the purple or violet, uh, which is appropriate to his rank also as a bishop. But for the more penitential days or uh, a Mass such as this, His Eminence wears the Episcopal purple rather than the cardinalatial red. You see his zucchetto there, his skull cap is still the red skull cap. Having prayed there before the Blessed Sacrament, now our, His Eminence comes to the throne and will witness a very beautiful ritual here of the vesting of a pontiff, the vesting of a prelate, a major prelate for Holy Mass. Most of us are, company, are used to, uh, accustomed to seeing Holy Mass begin with all of the ministers already vested and they, they process into the church already vested but in the ancient rite here, the vesting is something that the faithful also can watch. And of course, every single act that's happening now and throughout the whole liturgy is pregnant with very beautiful, deep spiritual meaning and also deep tradition. The reason why we watch a prelate such as His Eminence vest for Mass, we're, we're watching him take off the clothing of his ordinary day, that is, Mozetta here, and he's, he's putting off the old man, the worldly man. And we're going to watch him put on all of these very significant liturgical vestments, which indicate that it's no longer he who is at the altar, but it is the high priest, Jesus Christ himself. So he just took off his Mozetta there, and now, one by one, he will be presented with 
each vestment for Holy Mass. He's washing his hands now. The, the men kneeling in front of him are called the familiari, uh, the members of the household who are helping him to vest. So having just washed his hands, and he says a prayer, of course, accompanying that, the servers bring each piece of vestment and the subdeacon and the deacon help the priest in this case, we will call him the priest because that's the function he's serving here at Holy Mass to vest. So this is the Amos, which he prays that will become like a helmet of salvation that the Lord puts on his head to keep all of the incursions of the devil away from him that he might think holy thoughts and not be be distracted or or tempted with with thoughts of impurity or any other kind of impious distraction while he's offering holy mass. The great Scott Turkington is in the loft with a choir and an orchestra assembled for the occasion of this solemn day. Of course, Scott Turkington is the the choir master and the principal organist here at the shrine. We're going to hear some very beautiful music indeed today for this Holy Mass. The, the setting of the Mass itself is the famous Requiem of Gabriel Fauré. And we might have an opportunity later to say a little bit more about that, where that Mass comes from and how it's so beloved. Back to his eminence now is being vested with the alb. The alb is goes all the way back to the Old Testament priests of uh, the temple worship and even in the tent um, when the when the Israelites were still in the desert. So we we hear about some of these amazing vestments like the alb all the way in the Old Covenant and being clothed in white linen. The Cardinal prays that the Lord can wash him, will wash him and cleanse him from his sin, and that he might rejoice to have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, made white in the blood of the Lamb. Beautiful mystical prayer there. Ordinarily, he would be also putting on some other vestments in addition to the ones we see here, but the ceremony is stripped down somewhat for the Requiem Mass. He's putting on the cincture, also called the girdle sometimes, and he's praying that the Lord will cleanse him with the belt of faith, that his loins will be gifted with the virtue of chastity, and that that holy chastity can abide with him always. So his pectoral cross goes back over on top of the vestments he's worn so far, a special cord there to hold the pectoral cross. Ordinarily, his pectoral cross for this kind of a mass would have a relic inside. He kissed the cross when they put it on him. And now comes the stole. That most Roman of liturgical vestments, all the way back to the Roman senatorial class. So we are very much Roman Catholics, and we see that Roman heritage in every twist and turn of the sacred liturgy. Stole is always a sign of rank, both in the Roman political world and now in the liturgical world of the of the Catholic Church. So, the, the priestly stole is what is what sets that rank of office apart from deacon or subdeacon or indeed from the laity. Now he's putting on a tunicle. So this is the he will put on several garments before he puts on a chasuble. The tunicle is the vestment of the subdeacon because of course a priest is not just a priest but he's also a deacon and a subdeacon in all of the minor orders so the cardinal is putting on many indications of all of the orders that he represents not only as a priest but also as a bishop and indeed as a cardinal so first he puts on a tunicle and next will come the Dalmatic. The Dalmatic is, of course, that beautiful vestment that belongs to the deacon. You see the subdeacon and the deacon there tying the ribbons on the tunicle, and now comes the Dalmatic. 
over the cardinal's head and they'll do the same. So as you see layers and layers of liturgical significance here, once again, the privilege of being able to watch prelate vest like this gives us that happy reminder that a priest is not himself alone when he's offering the sacred liturgy. He's standing in the place of Christ, acting in the person of Christ, the high priest. When we go to Holy Mass, that's not as solemn as this with a priest officiating rather than without all of the ceremonial. It's an accommodation of what liturgy we're watching today. We, we basically trim down the liturgy for your ordinary parish mass to try to retain as much of what we're seeing here today insofar as that's possible with a trimmed down liturgy. So last on top here comes the chasuble, which in Latin means a little house. They've had different shapes through the centuries. This is a Roman shape chasuble. And on the back of it is the shape of a cross. So the prayer he says while he puts on the chasuble is about taking on the cross, bearing the cross of Christ. The sweet wit, and he says, reminds himself that our Lord tells us, my yoke is sweet and my burden is light. And so the priest prays that he's able to bear it with that kind of spirit so that he might, might obtain the grace of Christ as he offers the holy sacrifice. The deacon for Holy Mass today is Reverend Mr. Mr. Stephen Kalinowski, who is a priest of the Fraternity of St. Peter. He's at rather a deacon. He's a transitional deacon from the Archdiocese of St. Louis in his final year of formation at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Denton, Nebraska, for the priestly fraternity of St. Peter. So God willing, Deacon Kalinowski will be ordained a priest probably in the spring when many, when many ordinations happen, spring of 2025. The subdeacon is another Norbertine canon regular from St. Michael's Abbey, Father Gerard Uhaz. Newly ordained priest, he was just ordained in June of this year, so celebrating his first months of priesthood and here serving as the subdeacon. So the cardinal has put on his maniple, which is the, the vestment that goes on his left arm, and finally the mitre. The mitre, the white hat that he's wearing with, with two panes there, this is the simple mitre, uh, again, for the solemnity of uh, All Souls Day here, this Requiem Mass, a, a very simple mitre, not jeweled, not ornate, but the simplest form of mitre, which is this white damask or silk, and the flaps on the back, which are called uh, fabulae, rather fanons or infule, those are usually trimmed with a little red fringe for the cardinal. And we begin mass in the usual way here with the prayers at the foot of the altar. Standing next to the cardinal to our right, as we look at the altar there, is I believe that's Father Zachary Edgar, who is serving as the assisting priest for this mass. Father Edgar is the director of sacred liturgy and pontifical master of ceremonies here for the Shrine of Our Lady Guadalupe. I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's not who that is at all. That's Father Edward Nemeth, of course, who is the, he's the um, executive director of the shrine and he's serving as archpriest, so the assisting priest of Holy Mass there to the Cardinal's right. He's from the Archdiocese of St. Louis and was ordained a priest by then Archbishop Burke back in 2008. And he only recently became the executive director for the shrine about just really October 1st of this year. So just a few weeks ago, about a month ago, Father Edward Nemeth. Finishing the prayers at the foot of the altar now. The ministers will ascend the altar, go up and begin the Requiem Mass with its introit. Very shortly, we'll hear the Gabriel Fauré Requiem Mass begin with its Kyrie.
and there in the white surplus end, Rochet, there about to bring the miter to the cardinal, is the Master of Ceremonies, Canon Andrew Todd, who's with the Institute of Christ the King Sovereign Priest. He comes from Burlington, Wisconsin, where he's the general manager of the Sacred Heart Retreat Center. And now the Cardinal returns to the throne, and we will begin with the introit for the Requiem Mass, which it, where it takes its name. Requiem eternam dona eis domine, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. As we're about to begin here, you might also notice that the candles are of a brown color, unbleached wax, again, for the solemnity and, and poignant penitential quality of the Requiem Mass and suffrage for the holy souls. Just waiting now for the Cardinal to begin with that famous intro to Requiem Eternam Dona Eis Domine. Requiem Eternam Dona Eis Domine, ad lux perpetua luce Deis, felice dimnus Deus in Sion, et tibi redetur votum in Jerusalem, exaudio rationa mea mante omnes caro veniat. Requiem Eternam Dona Eis Domine, ad lux perpetua luce Deis. So the Cardinal begins there to say aloud the Kyrie eleison, the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. And very shortly we should be hearing the choir and orchestra begin. Dominus Fobiscum. Oremus. Fidelium Deus, omnium conditor redemptor, animabus famalorum, famalorum que tuarum remissionum cunctorum, trebue peccatorum, ut indulgentiam quam semper optaverunt, pi supplicationibus consequantur, qui vivis ad regnas in unitate spiritus sancti Deus per omnia secula So you just listen to the collect sung, that's the opening prayer. We skipped over the Kyrie for this Mass, and we'll move ahead now to the Epistle, which is from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. By the way, for those who are viewing at home, you can download the program with all of the texts for Holy Mass today from the website of the Shrine of Our Lady Guadalupe. If you'd like to follow along at home with that download of the program where you can see these texts, both in Latin and in English, And we move now to the readings of the Mass. As I said, the first letter to the Corinthians is the Epistle. And the subdeacon, Father Gerard Yu has, is recessing here while he will sing the Epistle here in front of the altar. And this is St. Paul telling us about how we shall indeed rise again, but we shall not all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise again incorruptible. Lexio Epistole Beati Pauli Apostoli Ad Corinthios Fratres, ecce misterium vobis dico, omnes quidem resurgemus, sed non omnes immutabimus, in momento, in ictu oculi, in novissima tuba, Canet enim tuba, et mortui resurgent in corrupti, et nos imutabimus, o portet enim corruptibile hoc in duere in A very simple tone here et mortale for the singing of the, of the readings. Almost what we call rectitono, which is, means a, a straight tone without a lot of inflection in the music. Again, the... Liturgy is trimmed down for a indication for all of us that we really are praying for the dead. Victoria. 
and, and that they need our prayers. Another lovely little fact about the ancient liturgy here, which goes, of course, all the way back to the time of Pope St. Gregory the Great, this Gregorian liturgy that we're watching praying today. The readings are, and many of the prayers directed actually toward God. That is, even the readings of the scriptures are offered to God as, as part of the sacrifice. Beautiful Gregorian chant of the gradual, the plain chant of the gradual, and very shortly the tract. The gradual again is Requiem Eternum Dona Eis Domine, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. Beautifully by the by the women of the choir there. Again, very ancient music here. This this plain chant of the church goes way back to before the first, into the first millennium, seventh century, eighth century music that we're listening to here, and of course, the beautiful mosaic of our Our Lady of Guadalupe here. The the reason for the shrine's existence, that beautiful mosaic crafted in the Vatican music mosaic studio. Framed beautifully with the beautiful silver roses, silver and light blue. Really the object of so much devotion here in the cross. People coming from all over the country, indeed all, from all over the world, to pray before this image and to gain the indulgences that it offers. You know, the shrine is linked not only to the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome, but also to the shrine, the sanctuary of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. And for those who are unable to make a pilgrimage either to Rome or to Mexico City, for whatever reason, they can gain all the indulgences that they would gain in those very same, those those places there, those basilicas abroad, by a pilgrimage to the shrine here in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Beautiful uh, epicenter of prayer and pilgrimage for God's people here in North America. They move now to the versicle of the gradual. Absolve, O Lord, the souls of all the faithful departed from every bond of sin. And by the help of your grace, may they be enabled to escape the avenging judgment. Very shortly, we are going to move from the gradual text that the fire is singing now to the sequence, plain chant sequence, one of the more notable and, and recognizable parts of the Requiem liturgy is the Dies Irae, a day of wrath. Uh, it's a poem, medieval Latin poem, attributed sometimes to Thomas of Celano, who was a Franciscan who lived from 1200 to 1265. Celano, of course, is a city in Italy. And this Latin poem serves as what we call the sequence of, of the Mass today. We are familiar with the sequence from Pentecost, which we all still pray and use even in the reform of the new liturgy. There's a sequence also for Corpus Christi. So the sequence is a liturgical text that fits in sometimes after the Alleluia, before the Gospel is read as a kind of extension of the Alleluia or for a mass like this where there is no alleluia because of its penitential and prayerful quality, the tract 
comes between the gradual and the reading of the Holy Gospel, the singing of the Holy Gospel. This Dies Irae has many famous settings throughout history, musical settings. Gabriel Fauré, whose mass setting is being used for this, this celebration, did not write a setting of the Dies Irae. So the, the choir will sing uh, the plain chant, uh, Gregorian chant version of this poem. Inspired from Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, which reads, Dies Irae, Dies Ila, in the Latin Vulgate, Day of Wrath, Oh, that great day. So alternating the verses here nicely between the men and the women in the choir. It's a long poem, many verses. It's in trochaic meter. That's the, the meter of the Latin text. So this text reads, day of wrath and doom impending, David's word with Sibyl's blending, heaven and earth and ashes ending. It speaks about the end of the world and our prayer that we be included among the elect and that even as Christ comes in glory to be our judge, that and as he sees each of our hearts and judges us accordingly, that we will be repentant of our sins and that we will be welcomed into his salvation and his glory. As the choir is praying this beautiful poem, we can imagine all of us praying this on behalf of the holy souls in purgatory, which is what this holy sacrifice is all, all, all about, suffrage for the holy souls in purgatory. That is, all of those friends of God who died in the state of sanctifying grace, but still have some purification before they can enter heavenly glory. Because as we know from the Holy Scriptures, nothing impure can enter into that eternal beatitude. And so if there's anything impure in us, that is anything that still needs to be perfectly, perfectly conformed to the holiness of God before we die, we have to catch up and, and allow the Lord to close that gap for us between our unworthiness and his supreme holiness. I sometimes like to imagine whenever All Souls Day rolls around that it's a little bit like Christmas Day in purgatory. Every priest has the privilege of offering three holy masses, which is an unusual thing. The three masses for the holy souls, and you imagine all of the priests in Christendom offering three holy masses today just for the holy souls and for their suffrage. You can pray audaciously that maybe Purgatory is emptied out today as all of God's people are praying for their loved ones and all of our prayers and sacrifices and fasting and penance on their behalf. You know, they're the poorest in the whole church. The souls in purgatory can't do anything on their own. They can't merit any longer. They can't uh, make up that gap, close that gap themselves. They wait upon the mercy of Christ and the prayers of the living and our prayers for them are beautiful gifts indeed, beautiful alms of our love for, for them. Because, of course, they are members of Holy Church, and, and even as yesterday we honored all the saints in glory, so today we turn our attention to those who are still waiting to join the ranks of all the saints in glory. He 
here. We're just coming to the final verses of the DZRA track sequence. See, like ash is my contrition, help me in my last condition. Oh, that day of tears and mourning from the dust of earth returning, man for judgment must prepare him. We close this prayer out saying, spare, O God, in mercy spare him. Lord, all pitying, Jesus, bless, grant them thine eternal rest. Jesus Domine, Dona Eis Requiem. Grant them eternal rest. Deacon Stephen Polanowski has retrieved the Evangeliarum, Evangeliarum, the gospel book, and he's coming out, out of the communion rail. He's going to go to the north side of the church and sing the gospel to the north while the subdeacon holds the gospel book. You see, there are no candles in the procession because of the Requiem Mass, penitential quality here. Sequentia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioanne. Gloria to the Gospels from the fifth chapter of St. John, beginning with verse 25. Tempore, dixit Jesus turbis Judeorum. At that time, Jesus said to the multitude of the Jews, Amen, I say to you that the hour comes and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear him shall live. Once again, the simplest gospel tone, very simple plain chant, singing of the gospel. The deacon sings the gospel facing the north because of the ancient tradition in our church that evil comes from the north. That's a scriptural idea from the Old Testament, that evil comes from the north. And the singing or the praying or the reading aloud of Holy Scripture, especially the gospel, keeps evil at bay. And so he faces the north whence evil wants to come to keep harm away from Holy Church. That gospel reading concluded. About the judgment, they who have done good things shall come forth to the resurrection of life, and they who have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. We have the privilege of listening to the sermon preached by His Eminence Raymond Leo Cardinal Burr. The acolytes there are bringing out a special chair. It's called a fald stool. There in front of the altar, the Cardinal will preach from the fald stool. The fald stool is a folding chair in English that that the root of that word faldstool is folding chair it's a portable it was in in ancient roman life a portable camp stool for military commanders so to carry into battle that would fold the two sides would fold together like a folding chair and to be carried into battle where the commander could then sit down and command his army and here pontiffs in the roman liturgy use this chair when they are preaching away from the throne or sitting at some other seat rather than the throne. So now we listen to the words of the Cardinal here, His Eminence. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face, the Little Flower, true to the Catholic faith regarding death and eternal life, was confident that after her death, she would continue to fulfill her vocation of love in the heart of the church. In fact, since the time of her death, countless faithful have received acts of her love signified by a shower of roses. The commemoration of all the faithful departed today 
expresses beautifully and powerfully the truth that although we suffer the loss of the earthly presence of our brothers and sisters who have died, we remain spiritually united with them. As we have loved them during their days on earth, so we continue to love them. The corporal and spiritual works of mercy, the charitable actions by which we come to the aid of our neighbor in his spiritual and bodily necessities include burying the dead and praying for the eternal rest of their souls. Our deceased brothers and sisters likewise continue to love us and pray for us. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us, our prayer for the dead is capable not only of helping them, but also of making their intercession for us effective. At the time of death, some of our brothers and sisters are already purified of their sins and their souls go directly to be with our Lord in heaven. Others, especially those who die suddenly, even though they die in God's grace and friendship and are assured of their eternal salvation, need to complete the purification of their sins. There is a temporal punishment associated with our sins, which derives from the unhealthy attachment to creatures, which even venial sin always involves. Although our sins are forgiven when we confess them with true sorrow, a conversion or purification of all unhealthy attachments must take place in us before we are prepared to enter into the company of Christ and all the saints. What needs to be satisfied through conversion or purification is commonly called the temporal punishment due to sin. It is not a matter of vengeance inflicted by God, but of a total conversion to Christ which overcomes all sin in our lives. Through our prayers and holy masses offered for the poor souls, we assist them in the purification of their sins. Our love of them inspires us to pray for them daily, especially obtaining for them the plenary indulgence, and to have holy masses offered for their eternal rest. Regarding the application of indulgences to the souls of the faithful departed, Dom Prosper Garanger reminds us, we well know how the church seconds the goodwill of her children. By the practice of indulgences, she places at their charitable disposal the inexhaustible treasure accumulated from age to age by the superabundant satisfactions of the saints added to those of the martyrs and united to those of our Blessed Lady and the infinite residue of our Lord's sufferings. These remissions of punishment she grants to the living by her own direct power, but she nearly always approves of and permits their application to the dead by way of suffrage, that is to say, in the manner in which each of the faithful may offer to God who accepts it for another the suffrage or succor of his own satisfactions. The month of November is a particular time of grace for strengthening our bonds with the poor souls. It is a time for us to renew our practice of daily prayers for the dead, especially obtaining for them the plenary indulgence and of having holy masses offered for the deceased to whom we are bound by bonds of love. The bond of love uniting us to our deceased brothers and sisters is expressed in the most fundamental way by the care for the reverent burial of their bodies and by our visits to their tombs. These are fundamental acts of faith for we firmly believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. St. Paul expresses our Catholic faith in the letter to the Romans, 
Behold, in the letter to the Corinthians, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. Our faith assures us that the good which the faithful departed have done in and through their earthly body accompanies them in death and will shine forth in eternity when at the Lord's final coming their earthly bodies will be glorified like his risen body. Commenting on the text of St. Paul, Dom Prosper Garanger teaches us, the humiliation of the tomb is the just punishment of original sin. But in this return of man to the earth from which he sprang, St. Paul would have us recognize the sowing necessary for the transmission of the seed, which is destined to live again under very different conditions. The body of the Christian, which St. Ignatius of Antioch calls the wheat of Christ, is cast into the tomb, as it were, into the furrow, there to leave its own corruption, the form of the, form of the first Adam with its heaviness and infirmity, but by the power of the new Adam, reforming it to his own likeness, it shall spring up all heavenly and spiritualized, agile, impassable, and glorious. And the words of blessed Columba Marmion, it is not enough for God to satisfy our souls with eternal happiness. It is his will that our bodies, like that of his son, should share in this eternal, in this endless beatitude. He wills to adorn them with those glorious prerogatives of immortality, agility, and spirituality with which the humanity of Jesus was resplendent on coming forth from the tomb. Our care for the dead, body and soul, is full of the sure hope which our Lord himself teaches us. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Savior's words nurture the faith and hope which inspire our celebration today in solemn prayer for all the faithful departed. Faith and hope in the resurrection of the body certainly exceeds the power of our imagination because it participates in the mystery of the redemptive incarnation, the taking of our human nature by God the Son, so that we may share in his divine nature, saving us from everlasting death and winning for us eternal life. Yet it is more real than anything else in our lives. For from the moment of our baptism, we are given a share in the resurrection of Christ, who is seated forever at the right hand of God the Father. The rites of the church, which surround the death and burial of her members, help us give expression to this reality, which is beyond our human imagination. For that reason, the church is insistent that we reverently prepare the bodies of the dead for burial, and that we bring the bodies of our dead to church to celebrate the Holy Eucharist, the pledge of eternal glory which the dead received during their earthly life. Likewise, we bury the bodies of the dead in the ground or in a mausoleum with prayers which express our anticipation of the resurrection of their bodies on the last day. Our participation in the Eucharist today, as always, 
is the pledge of our future glory. The consecrated bread and wine, which become the body and blood of our risen Lord, nurture within us the life of the Holy Spirit, who will bring us body and soul to the eternal life, which is our destiny. Nourished here with heavenly bread, we, like St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face, are called to fulfill continually our vocation of love. With her, we cannot rest until the end of time, when our salvation in the salvation of our world will be finally complete. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
with these beautiful rituals and liturgical gestures. And now the Cardinal, his eminence begins to incense the gifts. And you might recall from the book of Revelation, how we're reminded that the prayers of the faithful rise up to heaven like sweet smelling incense. And so our prayers join those prayers of His Eminence and all of Holy Church as we pray for the souls of the faithful departed. And as this incense rises up, so too our prayers rise up with it, up to God, uniting all of our intentions with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Again, the Cardinal's beautiful and simple mitre, the Mitra Simplex, as he receives the insensation there from the deacon. Removing his pontifical ring while the familiari wash his hands, the lavabo right here. We're very shortly now moving into the action of the Mass. The Roman canon very soon will listen to the preface and begin really what is the centerpiece of this whole liturgical rite. Orate fratres. Seminence prays there silently what we call the secret prayer and about to begin the preface for the dead. Dominus vobiscum Sursum corda Gracias agamus domino Deo nostro. Vere dignum et justum est, ecum et salutare, nos tibis semper dubique gratias agere, 
Domine Sancte Pater Omnipotens Eterne Deus, per Christum Dominum Nostrum. The preface here of the in faithful departed, again in a simple tone, speaking about all of those who hope of a blessed resurrection, saddened by dying, certain of a, the promise of a future mortality. Immortalitatis promissio. Tu is enum fidelibus domine vita mutatur non tolitur, et dissoluta terrestris, huius in colatus domo, eterna in celis habitatio comparatur. Et ideo cum angelis et archangelis, cum tronis et dominationibus, Umque omni militia celestis exercitus, im num gloriae tue canimus, sine fine dicentes. Sanct. The beautiful Sanctus of Gabriel Ferre as we begin the Roman canon. Opportunity now for all of us to enter into prayer as this most solemn time of the Holy Mass begins, we'll, we'll watch the beautiful offering of the Lord's sacrifice, the representation of Calvary here on this altar, accompanied by this heavenly 19th century music. And again, all on behalf of the holy souls in purgatory today. Back now to the altar, we see His Eminence praying the Epiclesis over the gifts. We're just now to be able to watch Him with the actual offering of the sacrifice. Privileged here to have this camera angle where we can watch the action so closely. That's not usually something that's available to us.
His eminence has said those most beautiful words ever uttered, the words of institution, bringing the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our blessed Lord here upon the altar here. He now completes the Roman canon. Once again, a, a prayer that reaches all the way back to the time of Pope St. Gregory the Great and even before, indeed, well before the very first centuries of our holy religion here. This is the memento of the dead, the, when the, his eminence is commemorating there silently all of the faithful departed that he's commemorating at this holy mass. The arch priest stepped away just for a moment there to give him that moment of peace and quiet while he made those recollections. cross over the sacrifice there beautifully mirrored the number of crosses before the consecration and the number of crosses after the consecration canon of the latin rite being one of the most perfect artistic creation pieces of artistic creation in all of human history in its poetry, Et omnia secula seculorum. its music, and most importantly, in its contents. It's a divine institution at all, but a divine one. Recepti salut caribus moniti, et divina institutione formati, audemus dicere. The, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. Pater noster qui es in celis, Sanctifice tuur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et emite nobis debita nostra. Sicud et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Amen. Move on now to the fraction rite. His eminence will break the host in half and break off a little corner of the host there to commingle with the chalice. Again, every turn of the sacred liturgy pregnant with, with spiritual significance here one of the many interpretations, the rejoining of our Lord's body. Omnia secula seculorum. Pax Domini sit semper vobiscum. And now we move on to the Agnus Dei. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant them rest. So the words are slightly changed for the Requiem Mass here from what we're most familiar with on the ordinary Sunday Mass. Lamb of God, 
who takes away the sins of the world. Grant them rest, grant them rest, grant them eternal rest. Seminence there praying just before he himself receives Holy Communion. The minister is bowing while he receives Holy Communion. Beautiful camera shot there of all of the ministers there at the altar and the unbleached beeswax candles there lighting the altar. They're all beneath the beautiful mosaic of Our Lady Guadalupe here at the shrine. Seminence there purifying the patent and about to receive our Lord's precious blood. Move now shortly here to the communion of the faithful. You see there, way back in the background, Father Zachary Edgar retrieving the Blessed Sacrament from the tabernacle for the faithful and begin the communion distribution here. Confiteor omnipotenti, beati Maria semper virgini, beati Michele Arcangelo, beati Ioni Baptiste, Sanctis Apostolis. On behalf of all of the faithful here present in the church, the ministers sing a confiteor, confess to Almighty God. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima. It's a way of disposing themselves to receive Holy Communion. Semper virginem, beati Michele Arcangelo, beati Ioni Baptiste, Sanctus Apostolos Petrum et Paulum, Omnes Sanctus et Pater, Orare pro mea dominum deum nostrum. Ipotens Deus, et demises peccatis vestris, producat vos ad vitam eternam. Indulgensum absolutionum et remissionum peccatorum vestrorum, tribu ad vobis omnipotens et misericors Deus. Amen. As all of the acolytes and sacred ministers prepare to receive Holy Ecce Communion, Agnes Dei, Ecce qui tolet it's a good opportunity for all of us Domine non sum dignus to make a spiritual communion. Meum, sed tandem dic verbo et senabitur anima mea. Domine non sum dignus to dentre subtectum meum, sed tandem dic verbo et senabitur anima mea. Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shalt under, under my roof, but only say the word and my meum, soul shall be healed. Sed tandem dic verbo et senabitur anima mea. And again, as I was saying there, spiritual communion, of course, is a very powerful way to pray if we're not able to receive Holy Communion for whatever reason, because we're watching from afar, a live streamed liturgy is this one, or if 
we're not disposed to receive while we're at Mass, but spiritual communion can be a very fruitful joining of ourself with our sacred Lord and receiving the graces that come from His presence within us, His gracious presence within us. Fares Requiem, Opus 48, was composed in 1888. The high point of the end of the Romantic period it was coming from a French composer and organist. In fact, it's the 100th anniversary of his death this year. He died on November 4th, 1924. So Two days from now will be the 100th anniversary of his death. A composer who links the end of the, romant of the Romantic period, Romanticism, with the more modern style that came in the second quarter of the 20th century. And we see both of those musical styles that he bridges represented in his music. It's a little earlier in his composition history there, so late 19th century. Beautiful, beautiful Requiem Mass here. Sometimes the settings of the Requiem Mass can be quite terrifying and, and evoke a certain fear or a certain seriousness, whereas this beautiful setting of Foray is a much more melodic and sweet, poignant uh, musical setting. One commentator calls it something rather akin to a lullaby of death rather than a fear-inducing monument to death. large crowd here at the shrine today to pray for the faithful departed.
good opportunity here for us to mention here uh, between some of the beautiful orchestral music while the faithful are receiving Holy Communion. That Baldacchino that you see there modeled after the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome, which from which it draws its inspiration. As does indeed the altar itself. listening to the Pia Jesu, part of the setting of the Requiem of Gabriel, Gabriel Foray, maybe the most recognizable of this mass setting. Lord Jesus, all merciful, grant them your eternal rest. executed there, that really lovely melody of the Pia Jesu of Gabriel Foray, beautifully sung by the soprano there. As I was saying, the even the altar itself, that beautiful marble sarcophagus-shaped altar is inspired by the altar in the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. The marble itself is a red marble called Ruse du Dua, once reserved for early kings of Europe, so a very precious kind of marble. Oh. 
We have a shot there of the catafalque that I mentioned at the beginning of the sacred liturgy sitting there in the main aisle in front of the communion rail. It's a coffin that's empty, and around it there you see six, again, unbleached wax candles, unbleached beeswax used for requiem masses. And that serves as a reminder, another reminder of our prayers for the dead, and it serves as a location for the ritual called the ablution that will happen at the conclusion of this Requiem Mass, the prayers for the dead appended to the Requiem Mass, and that catafalque becomes the location of those prayers. Interesting point of history there, those six candles that surround the catafalque, depending on the time of history and also the arrangement, the part of, of Christendom where such an arrangement was set up, a catafalque with those candles around it, sometimes the candles would be affixed to their own structure permanently, an arrangement that was called a hearse. And the hearse was the candlestick vehicle that would accompany a coffin. So in English, we use the word hearse to be the vehicle that carries a coffin. There, we have a good shot of it there. And we don't remember anymore in our language that that was originally a candle holder, a candlestick holder for a catafalque was the hearse. And there at the Requiem hearse surrounding a catafalque and of course that kind of a buyer situation sometimes can be quite tall for a papal requiem mass, for example. So different arrangements about this particular liturgical object for the requiem mass. And of course, when it's a real funeral, there is then a coffin with the body in it. Many communicants today, the ministers have to go up and get another ciborium and back down to distribute, hold a communion some more. It's a good opportunity for us to remember that Holy Church grants a plenary indulgence on All Souls Day for prayers for the faithful departed, assisting at the, the All Souls Day Masses, and through the whole octave of All Saints Day. So beginning on November 1st through November 8th, the possibility of gaining a plenary indulgence by praying in a cemetery, praying in any cemetery for the souls of the faithful departed, plenary indulgence applicable to the souls of the faithful departed under the usual conditions. And of course, that means going to holy, receive Holy Communion on the day that you want to receive or obtain that plenary indulgence, confession a few weeks before or after, prayers for the Holy Father's intentions. It could just be an Our Father, a Hail Mary and a Glory Be, and then making the intention to gain that indulgence during that indulgence act. So very easy to obtain indulgences for the holy souls here in this octave of All Saints Day and something we can all do very easily, a great gift for our loved ones who are still awaiting their liberation from purgatory. completed the distribution of Holy Communion, so now the purification of the vessels has just begun. And I see now that the zucchetto, the skull cap, is also of the Episcopal purple and not, in fact, in the cardinalatial red. 
as we mentioned there at the beginning of Holy Mass, the penitential quality of the Mass in suffrage for the Holy Souls indicates that His Eminence wears purple rather than red for His sacred vestments here today, underneath the black, of course. might notice there the acolyte with a handheld candle there. Another nice Roman liturgical vessel that we don't often see. Low candlestick there with a short handle. We call that the bugia. For this kind of a pontifical high mass, that bugia handheld candlestick there. is present wherever the priest prelate is praying. So when he's praying there at the throne, that acolyte with the candlestick will be with him there. Of course, all of these liturgical vestments and vessels and everything had some, has its origin in some important function. Having a candle lit there by a book when a priest or a prelate is reading from it is necessary in a dark cathedral in the Middle Ages where there's not electric light. So light to read by. Dominus Fabiscum. Oremus. Anima bus quesumus domine famolorum famolorum quetuarum. Oratio proficiat supplicantium. We arrive at the post-communion prayer. a peccatis omnibus exuas. Et tu e redemptionis facias esse participes, qui vivis et regnos cum Deo Patri, in unitate Spiritus Sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Dominus Fobiscum. Requiescant in pace. So there's no blessing at the end of the Requiem Mass. The deacon prayed there, may they rest in peace rather than go in peace. So instead of an ite misa es, we have the may they rest in peace, requiescant in pace. Move now to this appended ritual for the Requiem Mass called the Ablutions at the Catafalque. As I was describing there, that funeral buyer arrangement outside of the communion rail in the center of the church. The acolytes getting all the accoutrements ready for this ritual. And again, an opportunity for us to remember those for whom we especially would like to pray here this All Souls Day. 
those who are closest to us, family, friends, benefactors, who benefit so greatly from our prayers and sacrifices, not only today, but through the whole month of November, really, and through the whole year. But we remember the faithful departed and our beloved dead, especially on All Souls Day and through the month of November. So we have a vestment change happening here, a beautiful black cope coming out from the sacristy and so his eminence removing the chasuble. Once again, the beautiful indication here that we're able to watch, the privileged ability to watch as the vestments come on or are taken off. And because of the importance of these liturgical things that we do, no man by himself can do anything. He needs the assistance of deacons and subdeacons. And again, it's not because of the dignity of the man, it's because of the dignity of the office and the importance of the sacred, the sacred work that that liturgy is, that word that means work, the, the work of the people, the official work of the church, which is prayer, obviously, and sacrifice. So the dalmatic comes off and the tunicle comes off. not without some struggle there. And of course, it wouldn't be the sort of thing that, as I said, anybody could do by himself. It, it, this, this is the, the sort of vesting and divesting which needs help. And now we have the cope. Piviale in Italian it comes from the Latin, which has a reference to the fact that this was a functional raincoat. Uh, so the kind of thing that a priest or a prelate wears for liturgical event that is not the holy sacrifice of the mass. And he receives the mitre again and will have a short silent procession to the catafalque. Might have noticed there are no processional candles for the sacred liturgy. The only candle we see there in procession is that bugia, that handheld light that goes with the prelate and his book for the purpose of reading in a dark church and now symbolic and traditional. Only other two candlesticks there accompanying the crucifix for this short walk out to the catafalque, carried by the subdeacon there. And like his eminence coming down.
Okay, so all of the liturgical ministers assembling. What a privilege it must be for all of these young men to be able to serve such a beautiful liturgy with the Prince of the Church there in the person of Cardinal Burke and some of the other clergy. And the Faldstuhl comes back again for presiding away from the throne. We hear the beautiful bass intonation of the Liberame of Gabriel Faure. Liberame, deliver me, O Lord, from death eternal on that fearful day when the heavens and the earth shall be moved, when you shall come to judge the world by fire. And while we hear this amazing setting of the Liberame from the Faure Requiem, His Eminence will recite these same prayers that the bass is now singing. to tremble and I fear till the judgment be upon us and the coming wrath when the heavens and the earth shall be moved. That day, day of wrath, calamity and misery, the day of great and exceeding bitterness, when, when you shall come to judge the world by fire. And with those gripping words, then we conclude the eternal rest grant unto them with the Lord, perpetual action of all. Like the anthem of this Requiem Liturgy. Turn of the first text of this beautiful prayer. Deliver me, O Lord, from death eternal on that fearful day when the heavens and the earth shall be moved, when we shall come to judge the world by fire. Leave it to me.
now to the next prayers of the ablution, absolution. Pater Noster. His eminence intoned the Our Father, which he sang silently to himself while he sprinkles the catafalque with holy water. And in so doing, he is praying for all the faithful departed. And this, this catafalque here, these prayers said in this location are symbolic of prayers for all the faithful departed represented here in this ritual. Again, he'll go around the same, but this time with incense, holy water and incense by way of prayer and supplication and blessing. And then he'll complete the Our Father with some other chanted prayers to, lead, to free them from their sin and to save them from the gates of death. And then the final prayer of the absolution, which reads, Absolve, O Lord, we beseech you the souls of your servants and handmaidens from every bond of sin, that they may be raised up in the glory of the resurrection and live among your saints and elect. Through Christ our Lord. Aporta inferi. Requiescant in pace. Domine exaudio rationem meam. Dominus Fobiscum, Oremus, Absolve Quesimus Domine, animam, Animas Famulorum Famularum, fam, anima, Animas Famulorum Famularum Quetorum, Ab Omni Vinculo Delectorum, de Ut in Resurrectionis Gloria, Inter Sanctos et Electos Tuos, Resuscitati, respiren, res respiren, per Christum Dominum Nostrum. Requiem eternum donis Domine. Requiescant in pace. Amen. One final, may they rest in peace. Requiescant in pace. Anime orum omnium et omnium et anime omnium fidelium defunctorum. Per misericordium de requiescant in pace. Come now to the conclusion of this beautiful liturgy. The ministers will process back to the sacristy.
right in their order of seniority there, all of the acolytes first, and then the priests according to their rank. his eminence. Followed by the members of the household there. The familiari. One last beautiful piece of Gabriel Fauré to conclude our time together here today in Paradiso. Thank you very much for joining us, friends. And once again, I'm Father Ambrose, Canon Regular, a Premontre from St. Michael's Abbey. And this is the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe here in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We're very happy that you joined us for this Pontifical Requiem Mass. And we wish you a wonderful octave of all saints. And remember to continue to pray for the souls of the faithful departed to gain the indulgences for them. And please join us again, certainly on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, but hopefully before here in person, here at the shrine. Thank you for joining us and enjoy this last little taste of foray on this beautiful celebration, commemoration of the souls of all the faithful departed. God bless you.